I am always looking in every patient interaction to see how does this make sense? How does it make sense that you're anxious? What was going on beforehand that would have potentially brought up some feelings and had your anxiety spike, right? So that we could destigmatize mental health and we could help people understand that they're not crazy. This stuff doesn't come out of the blue. Your diagnosis is that you're human, that we all go through this together and that we can learn together and we can learn to heal together. I think it is important to reframe thoughts, but at the same time, acknowledge that sometimes thoughts are not easy to reframe. And I have a three-step process for working with thoughts. The first thing is to challenge their veracity or the truth of them. Just because you have a thought doesn't mean that it's more likely to happen or that it will happen. So you need to really look at it and say, well, what's the evidence for and against this thought? And when we say evidence, it's not another thought or belief. It's actually something that's observable by a a third person, um, a second, you know, a person that can say, this is, this is what I observe to be true or untrue. And I think once you put that through the litmus test, it's then important to try to reframe it in a way that can still feel realistic to the individual and they can get on board with. So this is where purely positive affirmations, especially super cheery ones are not going to work because it doesn't feel realistic to the person based on what's going on. And that's why I talked about this technique of yes, but where you basically construct your new thought using the structure. Yes, things have not been great lately, but I have practiced these tools and I believe they're going to make a difference, mm -hmm. right? So acknowledging what's not going right, but then acknowledging something, particularly something that you are working actively towards or something that honors your process and commitment that gives you the other side of the picture and really giving you a complete picture of what's going on as opposed to just a one-sided picture. But sometimes your negative thoughts are so strong and maybe there isn't a way to reframe it in the moment because you're just so stuck on that thought or maybe that thought isn't even a thought trap. Maybe things are just really bad right now. And that's when we use the technique of de-emphasizing the impact your thoughts have on your behaviors and your emotions. And in order to do that, it's really about separating yourself and your identity from the thoughts that you're having. And to do that, we really essentially re-label the thoughts and we label them differently in that we label them as a mental event. So if you have a thought that nothing will ever get better. That sounds so final. That sounds like it's happening right now or it's going to happen. But if you can just add the clause in front of it that says, I'm having the thought that things are not going to get better. It gives you the sense that the thought is just a mental event. It's a thought that you are having as a separate entity to the thought. And it gives you a sense that perhaps there could be a way to resolve the situation and that perhaps the situation you feared isn't even going to happen. I can't be any different than I am right here in this moment. And if I can give myself permission to be exactly me, having areas of expertise in certain places and that there may be some questions that really throw me that I don't know the answer to and that that in and of itself could be okay. I could help regulate my anxiety, but absolutely I still get symptoms where again, stomach upset, sweaty palms, heart racing. I can feel in complete self attack mode, right? And the key for me is being able to notice it, to regulate, to see what's going on and remind myself, right? Often when I'm in this kind of place of self-attack, gosh, you can't be any other way, anywhere other than you are, right? You, what you have to offer is totally enough and you couldn't offer any more than what you have right here in this moment. And for me, that's an important mantra to keep my self-attack and my anxiety at bay. In the realm of mental health, what would your ideal world look like? Gosh. Um, in the, in the world of mental health, my ideal situation would be complete normalization of symptomatology, right? So that we could destate 
stigmatize mental health and we could help people understand that they're not crazy, this stuff doesn't come out of the blue, that I am always looking in every patient interaction to see how does this make sense? How does it make sense that you're anxious? What was going on beforehand that would have potentially brought up some feelings and had your anxiety spike, right? Why what might you be depressed right now? What's going on in your life that brought up some feelings, had you get anxious and now you're kind of attacking yourself or isolating or avoiding? How can we make sense of this and see, you know, um, the catchphrase that I love is right, that your diagnosis is that you're human, that we all go through this together and that we can learn together and we can learn to heal together. So many people have imposter syndrome and not just in a professional stance. Uh, parents feel that way. Uh, siblings, friends, coworkers. I mean, in any situation, you can have that imposter syndrome. For those of us experiencing that, what would be your one uh, word of advice? Uh, so if we think about imposter syndrome, right, so many people experience this. And if we get really clear about what is imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome is a form of self-attack. It's a way that I attack myself and tell myself that I'm not enough, that the way that I'm operating as a parent, as a worker, as a friend, as a son or daughter, right, isn't enough. And so... Um, Part of it often in places where we actually have a lot of experience or doing a great job can be related to struggling to hold healthy pride, to feel good and confident about what we know. And then the other part can come when there are holes in our learning or in our capacity and that there is no one who is a perfect parent, a perfect teacher, a perfect doctor, right? And that um, when we have to hold this juxtaposition of, I know a not a lot. I have healthy pride over that, but there are things I don't know. And I might feel some guilt around that or feel uncomfortable that I have to say, sometimes I don't know. Rather than holding these mixed feelings of this is who I am. This is what I have to offer that I am enough exactly as I am. We get anxious and then we attack ourselves. We say, gosh, you know, nothing. Oh, you, you shouldn't even be, you can't, shouldn't even call yourself a doctor, Christy, right? Those are things that we can do to ourselves, but we, it's so important that we recognize that self-attack comes in the face of anxiety over mixed feelings. I'm proud of what I know. I'm proud of the position that I've taken on. And there are things that I don't know. And can I hold this kind of really complex mix of being an expert and a learner, right? Knowing things and not knowing things. Gosh, can that make us anxious? And rather than tolerate the anxiety and feel these feelings, we often dump into this self-attack and call ourselves an imposter. So the more that we can own what we know, allow the space for what we don't know, and settle into the anxiety that that provides and let that kind of com complexity sit, our anxiety can come down and we can be enough exactly as we are. What is the role of hope in mental health? So, you know, I would suggest that hope is actually one of the cornerstone uh, kind of ingredients in regard to mental health. That when I have patients who come in and tell me they have no hope, we actually can't go any further. We have to start right there. Because if they have no hope, I can hold 110%, 150%, 200% of the hope. If they have no hope, we can't really go anywhere. That it is when we start to create space that things could change, that we could work together to make things different in your life. Then we've got room for potential, for possibility, for change. And this is what hope is, right? So in, in my experience, we really can't go anywhere in mental health, in regard to finding symptom reduction, in regard to changing our lives, unless we start with hope, even if it's just a little window, right? I always tell my patients, I'll carry that. I can carry the bulk of this, but I can't carry all of it. We have to align that there's at least some hope that we can start to tap into and expand for change to happen. When I had that thought that I'm failing my son and I'm a failure, I noticed it and I caught it. I had probably been feeling that way and thinking those things for quite some time. But when I noticed that thought, because I was able to really pay attention to it, I was able to question it. I was able to label it 
as a thought as opposed to as reality. And I was so, so grateful that that's something that I already had the skills to do due to my own therapy and my therapy training that I challenged it. I said, no, this is not true. I'm not a failure and I'm not failing my son. I feel like I am, but I'm not because I'm here. I'm doing the best that I can and everything else will figure itself out. This obviously didn't magically fix everything. I didn't start to feel better right away, but I know that had I not caught that thought and had I not labeled it as just a thought, I would have spiraled and it would have been really, really hard for me to manage my emotions, to actually give myself the opportunity to connect with my son and to connect with those around me so that I could feel a little bit less isolated. I heavily believe in what I consider, um, I call it the five V's, so for thriving. And I know that they work because I use them. So the first one was to validate how I was feeling. Um, a lot of times, especially in the medical field and then professional fields, you feel like you have to really put others first, but it's really important to validate how you are feeling. So I had to validate that this was painful, emo emotionally difficult. Um, and then I had to vent. And so, you know, venting for me was regularly meeting with my own therapist. Um, I had to really take care of the vitals, right? I had to take care of my sleep patterns, my eating, um, making sure I was still exercising and keeping my body in that routine. And then focusing on the values, um, the fourth B, which is like, what do I, what are my true values? My values at the time were my family, my friends and his legacy. Um, and then vision, right? Keeping things in mind for the future. So uh, myself and the rest of the community made sure that we were going to memorial memorialize him every year, get together every year. So having something on the calendar to look forward to, to keep you moving forward. Those five Vs really helped me to get through that. And I really see um, you know, this theme with my patients today, like people who can pull on these strengths and these five Vs really do well in the face of obstacles. You know, the funny thing is, is that when you talk about the moment I felt I could get out and, you know, I've said this on other med circle videos is the only way out is through Robert Frost and all of that. But I have to say it was less about, I knew I was going to get out than I can think of a different way of thinking about this mm -hmm. because to me, so much of mental health is about acceptance, right? We can't rewrite our pasts. The things that have happened to us have happened to us. They have. Can't go back and have different parents. Can't have had, uh, can't eliminate the traumas that have happened to us. Can't eliminate the losses that have happened. Our stories are our stories, right? And so the question then becomes, for me, it was the coming out of it moment was I got to do something differently. And mm -hmm. so the, you know, it was, it's more of a, in a way, going through a mental health crisis, once you can start getting, you know, almost like to the other side, if you will, getting closer, is you start giving yourself permission to say, are there other options? <laughs> are there other things I could do? Can I do differently, feel differently, act differently? And that's really where it turned for me is like, okay, there's things I can do. Part of that actually culminated in me retiring from a long standing academic job. Some of the traumatic themes I've, I've alluded to impacted that job. And while it hit me financially, as you could imagine, I thought this is in the, in the grand scheme of things. And this is when it's hard, you know, you're doing all this accounting, like the one thing is dollars and cents. And the other is like, what's the price of my soul? I haven't quite figured that out, but apparently it was about the equivalent of my academic salary. So I was like, I, I gotta get, I, I gotta get out of this, you know? And, and like I said, there's going to be a co financial costs and all of that for me, but um, it had these, had this mental health crisis recently not happened and the cumulative crisis of COVID a, a family health issue, um, all not happened. 
I think I would have stayed in an inertia state. And instead, basically, it was like the universe or the world or my mental health or something metaphysical slapped me across the face and said, what are you going to do about it? And so it was a, a huge, it was a huge call for me. And some people around me said, are you sure you know what you're doing? I said, no, but I am, I've got to, I've got to do something. And I have to say it's relieved, it's relieved some of some fears and tensions and other things that, that were coming from that. So that's great but there's still some other tweaks that need to happen. And the other, the other way I knew I was kind of coming out of it was I was getting a lot better at paying attention to sort of how I feel and really giving credence to that saying, mm, on this day, I feel well, on this day, I don't feel well, but let's look at the difference between those two days and figure out what things are in my control between those two different kinds of days. Now, obviously between you and me, Kyle, if somebody gave me enough money, I'd be like, peace, I'm out. I'm just gonna go sit in some sort of green place or snowy place, or maybe go back to New England or something like that and live quietly. I could not work for the rest of my life, I'll have to be honest with you, but that's not in the cards for me. So, um, so for me, it was really like, how is this gonna lead me to think and do differently? And the severity of what I've gone through in the last eight, nine months, what ended up being a call to arms. And it's a call to arms that has changed my life with a, um, with an intentionality and a power that I don't think I would have had unless all this terrible stuff had happened to me. When you are in that space of an emotional, mental health challenge, obstacle, perhaps suffering from trauma or any mm -hmm. number of things, and you haven't reached the point of, I, ha I need to change something. You're still at the point of, oh my gosh, I just want to mm -hmm. sleep. Mm -hmm. What is your advice to those people in, in that space? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. When I look at my own story and say, why didn't you crawl into bed and not get out? Because let me tell you, for several months there, that is all I wanted to do. I have a child. Child needs breakfast. Um, bills need to get paid. I have staff that needs to get paid. I have a mother that I need to check in on. Like I, in many ways, the people around me, and I think this is a very, in, in some ways, I know it's, it's many women certainly find themselves in this role of there's people I've got to take care of. And those people I have to take care of, I couldn't, it wasn't in my reality or in my identity. However, I know there's people out there who very much identify as incredible caregivers and they still find that they can't get out of bed. And I understand that as well. For me, it was about breaking my day into pieces that were manageable. It, I would sometimes look at my calendar and say, in fact, I don't wanna tell you the obscenity that more mornings than not, I start. Like I basically, I'm like, you know, curse word me. I can't believe I have to do this again. That was literally, I'm like, wow, that's really what you say every morning. Like that alarm goes off, first thing that comes out of my mouth and my cat's next to me every morning hearing this. I mean, so it's all, it's, it's, it's sort of a really tragic tableau if you want to think about it. But what I did was, and I do is, and I've said this before is I've got three things I do in the same order every morning. This is actually in many ways where I think my cat may have saved me. She had to get fed and she had to, and she knew she had a routine in the morning. She'd come, she'd lie next to me. But then I'd stir, she, and, and she'd wait until the sun kind of comes up just a tiny bit. So she'd never wake me up in the dark. And then, um, and I had to get out of bed to feed her. And once I was standing, I'm like, okay, girl, you're standing. And then I would, I would use the bathroom and brush my teeth, go downstairs, make my tea. And now the day had started. One, two, three, cat, basic ablutions, make the tea. And when that three-step process had started, it was almost like imagining a plane going up a runway. The day had kind of started. And even if, and then what I did try to do is I do try to follow routines. Like, you know, th th then this is gonna happen, this is gonna happen. And then I cut the day in pieces. When you're seeing clients, that logically happens. It's an hour, it's an hour, it's an hour, it's an hour, right? And so that helped me. And on days that were more free form, I'd cut the day up into chunks, sometimes 15 minutes at a time, because I couldn't imagine thinking about the 12 hours ahead of me. And I have to say sort of breaking it into these manageable chunks 
before I knew it, I'd lift my head and say, wow, we got all the way to three o'clock or wow, we got all the way to seven o'clock. And then I did other preventative things. A lot of the stuff that was coming at me that was harming me was coming via text messages and emails and that kind of thing. So my team, I have the best team on the planet. They said, we're managing these emails. And at the end of the day, we're sending you a summary and you will handle the important stuff and we are going to protect you from the rest of it. And there, that speaks to social support, Kyle. Because what I was surrounded by was people who, who saw the crack showing. They said, we know what's causing this. It would cause it for us, but this isn't coming at us. It's coming at you. So we're going to be the front team on this, just as I would do this for anyone else. They protected me from that, and they helped me order my day too. So that combination of social support, that cat that would get me out of bed, the three steps that I would do that the rest of the day would kind of logically fall from, and deconstructing my day into reasonable chunks. It was like cutting my food, right? You're not going to stick a whole, you're not going to stick a whole pancake in your mouth. You're going to cut it into pieces. It was the same thing. It made it digestible. And then, you know, some days I have to admit, and it's still like this, Kyle, I feel like I'm just enduring the days. And then there's some days where the joy cuts through and, and hopefully with time, more of the joy filled days will be there than just the days that I'm feeling like I'm enduring and just pushing through. Thanks for watching. Check out the links below for more information on how to access this full series and subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch new mental health videos every week. Did you like what you heard in this video? If you want to ask a MedCircle doctor a question directly, you can learn how by visiting the links in the description below.